Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club, the place where news happens. My name is Lisa Nicole Matthews, and I am the 114th president of the National Press Club and assignment manager for U.S. Video at the Associated Press. Thank you for joining us today for our headliners event with Air Force Chief of Staff, General Charles Q. Brown, Jr., or as he refers to himself, C.Q. Brown, Jr. We'll get started in a moment, but just a reminder that we are happy to accept your questions, and I will ask as many as time permits. To submit a question, please email headliners at press.org. Air Force Chief of Staff General Charles Q. Brown, Jr. is the first and only black service chief in the U.S. history, and he hasn't been shy about calling out the military for its failure to diversify the leadership ranks and the racism that still exists within it. General Brown has said that the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement made the Air Force take a hard look at itself. <clears throat> Excuse me, a recent report found that black air personnel have lower promotion rates and fewer leadership opportunities. That, Brown says, must change in order for the Air Force to make the best use of its talent and remain competitive with its adversaries. That competitiveness forms the basis of General Brown's admission, his mission, I should say. Last year, General Brown, who is responsible for the training and equipping of 689,000 active duty general reserve and civilian forces serving in the United States and overseas, announced the Air Force's new strategic approach, which he titled, Accelerate, Change, or Lose. For the Air Force to control the skies and maintain its ability to strike anywhere in the world, it must modernize further, especially to keep peace in the Pacific China's, as China expands its military might. His order last year recognized four areas of focus, identifying talent, speeding up decision-making, understanding, and responding to competition and adaptability. We look forward to hearing more about that mission today. And at this time, I'd like to welcome General C.Q. Brown to the podium. Let me uh, start off this afternoon with a uh, quote from uh, Jack Welsh, an esteemed businessman and author. And he said, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, uh, the end is near. In this slide, I, I question the rate of change for our United States Air Force, particularly as they look out at our strategic uh, competition. I would submit the, uh, the time for change is now, and the duty to modernize the United States Air Force to meet the challenge of tomorrow lands upon my shoulders and the shoulders of this generation. Next month, as many of us know, marks the 20th anniversary of 9-11, one of the most tragic days in America's history. Many of us can remember where we were uh, at the time on that particular day. For me personally, I, I was deployed. I was deployed to Prince Sultan Air Base in Saudi Arabia as they deployed to fighter squadron commander. And uh, I was not flying that day, and, and I was the uh, supervisor, uh, uh, our, our top three uh, uh, in the squadron. And it was our intel uh, non-commissioned officer who came to me and said that the, uh, an aircraft had hit the World Trade Center. And so I was thinking it was a light aircraft, having uh, seen that happen before, but had no idea that it was a uh, civilian airliner and one of several that would hit different locations across the United States. And I'll tell you that uh, I was there for that, but I also was uh, there for the kickoff of, uh, I still deployed uh, when Operation Durham Freedom kicked off in October. And then I came home just a couple weeks later uh, to a completely different country. Uh, what I mean by that, it was just a level of patriotism uh, that I saw with all the flags uh, that were flying around and then the many people that stopped me uh, and continue to do so to, to thank our military members for their service. Um, it was a catastrophic event, 
and it really drove change into how we as an Air Force and we as a Department of Defense and our Joint Force uh, changed to what it is today. 9-11 uh, was a, a, a crisis and an apocalyptic level that changed the American way of life. Today we are seeing the rate of change that challenges the rules-based international order that we've known since World War II. Uh, this challenge is a way uh, of the, the strategic competition that may not be as stark as a, a catastrophic event or something like a 9-11 event, um, but it can be just as catastrophic. If we wait for another cataclysmic event to drive change for our Air Force and our Joint Force, I submit it may be too late. And we may risk defeat. China is modernizing its military, proliferating its systems and technology around the world, and reforming the economy with a purpose to rival and surpass the U.S. as a global power. We cannot wait, and we must change now. Over the last year, the Air Force has been working very hard to understanding our pacing threat to China and develop an enterprise approach to deliver air power anytime, anywhere. Not just now, but well into the future. I want to take a moment for, uh, to thank the National Press Club for the invitation to be here with you today uh, and hosting this event. Uh, and then uh, I want to thank all of you that have covered our, our U.S. military, uh, whether here in Washington, D.C., or all across the nation, but particularly for our members that are deployed in harm's way. And uh, thank you, Elisa, for the, uh, the very kind introduction. Today, I want to spend just a few minutes uh, telling you uh, how I see the global security environment, the threat I see from uh, China, uh, how it, uh, what it poses to stability, and how the Air Force is accelerating change uh, so air power can continue to be decisive in the future. Ideally, when we leave here today, uh, uh, I want you feeling as concerned as I am and understanding that the rate of change must increase. Now, when I look at my Air Force career, I can break, I've been doing this for 36 years. Um, and I, I still don't feel as old as I am, um, but uh, it seems like yesterday when I came in. But I can break out my career pretty much in, into three distinct phases. Uh, I came in at the end of the Cold War and uh, watched how we had uh, built up, and uh, you know, I'd set nuclear alert and understood what the Cold War was all about. And then uh, back in August of 1990, we made a shift, what I would say, after, particularly after the wall came down, into uh, a tremendous focus into the Middle East, uh, whether it be uh, Iraq, um, violent extremists, or Iran, was part of our focus, and that's what we've been focused on really for the past uh, uh, almost 30 years. And then, uh, as the National Defense Strategy of 2018 came out, we moved into an area of strategic competition. And one of the things I would highlight to you is uh, uh, there's a very stark um, photo that, or print that I get to look at every day when I come into the Pentagon. It's the uh, Wings Through Time by uh, Robert Emerson Bell. It was uh, a print that was done for the 50th anniversary of the Air Force. And on that print, um, on the far left of the print is the Wright Flyer. And it shows every airplane that's been built since then to the 15th anniversary of the United States Air Force. Next year will be our 75th anniversary. From 1984, uh, excuse me, 1944 to 1984, we were building a new fighter every two and a half years. Since 1984, the year I was commissioned, we built probably about four fighters. And we really slowed our pace. Um, and so if I was to extend that print out, there wouldn't be much on it as far as uh, what we've been able to do as an Air Force. And uh, I really believe that we've got to look at how we accelerate. The fact that airplanes we're flying today, like the B-52 and the KC-135, if you put them on that, uh, uh, and you look at them on that print, they are closer to the right flyer than they are to today. And that tells you something about our United States Air Force and how we need to change. Now, the 2018 National Defense Strategy and the Interim National uh, Security Strategic Guidance make it clear. China is our pacing challenge, and they are actively looking to erode our competitive advantage. Uh, they're really looking at a, uh, what I would say, a whole of government approach, um, and it's applied through economic reform, control of their industries, how they modernize their weapons and equipment, and the ref, uh, how they've reformed, uh, done reforms in their strategy, their training, uh, and their doctrine, and their human capital development. And I really believe it's all specifically designed to, to defeat the advantage that the United States has, um, particularly from a military aspect, but I also say from an economic aspect as well. The People's Liberation Army recognizes modern warfare as a contest among operational systems, not necessarily individual units or uh, platforms. And we 
tend to think in platforms. And we're very focused on, on platforms, not only as, the, uh, as an Air Force, but I'd say across the nation as well. According to Xi Jinping, uh, China's armed forces will be uh, fully modernized by 2035 and be world class by 2050. China continues to move that modernization timeline left with its rate of change outpacing the United States. They've accomplished the modernization of their force by making some very tough resourcing decisions. They believe that will fund and defeat the United States by 2035. And they, their change in the, and how they made that change and prepared themselves is they cut the less relevant parts of their force to invest in the parts of the force they need to gain that advantage. Already, the People's Liberation Army has the largest aviation force in the Indo-Pacific, the largest conventional missile capability in the Indo-Pacific. They're fielding hypersonic missiles, and they've established bases and military strategic points, many in areas that uh, the U.S. already has uh, uh, facing, but it also challenges our partnerships uh, with many of the uh, countries we work with on a regular basis. We've also run a number of war games, um, and, uh, and as we've gone through those war games, we've learned some things. Um, and uh, our Vice Chairman General uh, Hyten uh, just uh, recently uh, mentioned, and I quote, without overstating the issue, uh, addressing one of the war games, he said, it fell miserably. They knew exactly what we were going to do before we did it. China's are also uh, disrupting the current international order, not by breaking the institutions that exist today, but infiltrating and building rival ones. Uh, they're strangling our, our smaller, uh, smaller nations uh, through their One Belt, One Road initiative, and bullying larger nations through uh, its trade strategy. Uh, one of the uh, areas that uh, I know based on talking to my Australian friends is, as Australia made some comments uh, and spoke out about uh, territorial disputes in the uh, South China Sea and human rights, um, the Chinese quit importing their Australian wine and uh, really putting pressure on, uh, on their economy. I would say that the, uh, uh, China, the People's Republic of China is using all instruments of power to achieve their goal, and, and we are behind. To put the gravity of our pacing challenge into perspective, at the height of the Cold War, the USSR's GDP was 57% of the U.S.'s. China's economy will likely uh, exceed the U.S.'s in dollar terms as the largest economy in the world in the next 10 years. What this means is that China will challenge the U.S. as a competitor and as a peer adversary in a way we've not seen since World War II. They will use the economic and military means to influence the international stage in ways uh, against the U.S. interests. And I really believe, without change, we, we are at risk of losing. Risk of losing our competitive advantage in the highly contested environment, risk of losing our credibility with our joint teammates and our allies and partners, risk of losing the quality airmen and our families um, if we don't change as an Air Force, but most importantly, our ability to defend our national interests. Now, exactly one year ago today, I became the 22nd Chief of Staff of our United States Air Force. I never aspired to have this position, uh, but I will tell you I've committed my adult life to the defense of our nation. And now in the position I'm in, I want to make sure the United States Air Force continues to be a critical component of our national security. As I communicated in our recent uh, posture hearings in support of the FY22 budget uh, to, to address the challenges that endanger our national security, the transition for the future of the Air Force to future design must start today. If we're not able to phase our transition starting with the FY23 budget cycle submission, we will likely miss the mark and the consequences will be irre irreversible. And in 2030, we could have the same force that was largely designed during the Carter and Reagan administrations. Um, and we'd be fighting uh, pacing challenges with the force of yesterday. And we'll be able to dominate the skies and the face, we'll face a rate of attrition akin to what we saw during World War II. It's because the United States Air Force's relentless dedication to provide air power that the U.S. Any, a, a US service member has not been bombed by an aircraft from the air since the Korean War. Air power has become reliable as the breath you just took. You don't think about it, you count on it, and you can't live without it. The Joint Force needs air power. They can't operate without it. The Air Force we're designing for 2030 is a winning Air Force. It is based on analysis and data to ensure the resource and decisions we're, uh, go we're gonna make are grounded in facts and analysis, rather than emotion and a love of yesterday. 
This will make it uh, some, uh, if not most people, unhappy. But we will do what is right for the United States Air Force, not for an individual platform or a specific community. Simply put, we're designing Air Force to win. Our force is shifting from a platform-centric to an enterprise-level problem-centric capabilities. When our sister services, Congress, and our adversaries think about our Air Force, we want them to think about what we do before focusing on the platforms we use to do it. After a year of a, a constant discussion with uh, uh, my senior leadership inside the Air Force, we uh, now have a uniform and succinct message to tell what we need to do to win tomorrow that can be summarized in our mission statement. The mission of the United States Air Force is to fly, fight, and win, air power, anytime, anywhere. Not sometime in some places, it is anytime, anywhere. If modernized, our future Air Force will provide air power with the effects in the air, on the land, and at sea. We will continue to answer our nation's call regardless of the operational environment. We are the only service that provides our joint teammates, our allies and partners, the assurance of a superiority, the advantage of global strike, and the agility of rapid global mobility. And you can combine with that the Air Force's intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities with command and control, which provide the ability to sense, make sense, and act. That's what we do today, and what we must be prepared to do tomorrow. Our future force must be agile, resilient, and digitally connected to ensure tomorrow's combatant commanders can continue to generate near instantaneous effects anytime, anywhere. We worked hard over the past year to develop an enterprise approach to ensure the Air Force can answer our nation's call. To ensure air power is still decisive in 2030, we develop a way ahead for each of the Air Force's uh, core missions. To accomplish air superiority, we must right-size our fighter fleet to expedite the transition away from the less capable uh, fleets that we have today of aging aircraft and emphasize investment in future capability. Moving from the seven fighter platforms we have today to what we call a uh, four plus one as we look forward. We also need to ensure we uh, can defend our air bases and generate combat power by investing in passive defense, cyber defense, and defense against unmanned aerial systems. If we don't accomplish right-sizing our fighter fleet and defending our bases, we'll be challenged to generate combat power. To accomplish our global strike mission, we need to transition our bomber fleet from a three bomber fleet to a two bomber fleet. We must ensure the Air Force's uh, contribution to the nuclear triad is safe, secure, reliable, and still deters against the threat. Modernizing our ACBM capability with the ground-based strategic deterrent and bringing on the B-21 will be paramount. As a backstop for our nation's diplomats and the foundations for our strategic deterrence, the nuclear portion of our global strike mission is a zero-fill mission. Our other non-nuclear missions must be long-range, relevant, and provide a volume of fire against our adversary that has uh, advanced denial, denial capabilities. In order to provide rapid global mobility that can uh, deliver relief or combat capability in hours, not days and weeks, we need to right-size our tactical airlift fleet and continue to procure the KC-46. If our mobility fleet is not sized with the appropriate capability mix, we will lose the operational reach and the ability to project power for the United States and for Air Force around the world. The right command and control, we need to continue to invest in advanced battle management systems to achieve decision superiority. We need to modernize our sensing grid and ability to track air and ground targets to be the mechanism to provide battlefield awareness. Advanced battle management system, the network that connects sensors to shooters will give us the ability to sense, make sense, and act fastest. If we do not modernize to provide air power anytime, anywhere, we are at risk of losing our most precious assets, our airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, and guardians. They will become casualties when they are shot down, bombed by any aircraft, or sunk at sea. The United States Air Force in 2021 is the, is the greatest in the world and the greatest Air Force in the history of the world. My job, in collaboration with our key stakeholders, is to ensure our Air Force continues to be both in 2030 and beyond. From 2000 to 2020, China has uh, transformed itself from a regional power into a strategic peer with world-leading anti-access area, deni area denial capabilities. This force is custom designed to defeat the United States. 
and our advantage. The question that keeps me up at night is what happens when our diplomats no longer have the might of the U.S. military or our economy as their backstop. This is the world that none of us wants, uh, want to live in. U.S. air power has been, is, and will continue to be vital to ensuring our national interests. Although this problem takes place in the future, the solution must be realized today. I believe we have the will, the way, and the means, and I'm excited to work with our new Secretary of the Air Force, the Honorable Frank Kendall, someone I believe to be the perfect leader at the right time and the right place for the job. Now, despite the enormity of the task ahead, our nation, the Department of Defense, and our United States Air Force, we're beginning to build momentum, in selling the, celebrating the rate of change. We must seize the momentum, uh, moment of opportunity right here, right now. If we don't, losing all we cherish becomes a distinct possibility. And I'm committed as the Air Force Chief of Staff to push for a rate of change so that possibility never materializes. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here with you today, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to start off with the news everyone is talking about, because I don't like to bury the lead. OK, go right ahead. Everyone's talking about COVID today and uh, vaccinations for COVID and concerns about the Delta variant. Um, can you tell us uh, your thoughts about mandating uh, vaccinations for our service members, our airmen? and uh, concerns that our service members have maybe expressed to you about uh, receiving a vaccination? Well, the first thing I, I would tell you on this is that um, when, when I think about the vaccination and uh, the, how COVID has impacted, it really, it's an aspect of making sure we're ready and making sure we have the readiness to, to be able to execute whatever the nation calls. Um, and, um, it is a force protection aspect uh, from a health pr perspective. They want to take care of our airmen and their families to ensure that uh, um, from a health perspective, they're taken care of. Now, there's the, you know, it's a policy decision that, uh, in the department whether or not to, uh, we mandate um, uh, the, the vaccination. Uh, right now, what I'm doing is encouraging all of our airmen to get vaccinated. And if you're not going to get vaccinated, uh, you need to follow the, the guidance of uh, you know, wearing a mask. And uh, as you see, we've increased mask use here over the past several weeks. What's the current percentage of uh, airmen who've been vaccinated at this point? Right now, fully vaccinated, so it's over 60%. Um, and it's over 60, uh, high 60s in those that have had at least one dose. And so we're continuing to uh, uh, push. And what we're finding, just like we're seeing across the nation, um, you know, those who are not vaccinated are the ones that are actually being impacted uh, by the Delta variant. And so uh, we're, um, between myself, the secretary, and the rest of the senior uh, leadership in the United States Air Force, and in the Department of the Air Force with the Space Force, encouraging our, our members to get vaccinated, uh, expecting that they, uh, uh, you know, at some point it'll be mandated, just like we do just our normal flu shot right. um, and going forward. So we'll, uh, we'll just encourage, continue to encourage our, our uh, airmen to get the vaccinated. How basically. difficult do you think it will be to enforce it, and um, will service members be forced to leave uh, if they don't receive the vaccination? Will they be discharged? Now, th th again, that'll be a policy decision on, you know, that we'll have to go through. But, um, you know, there, there may be some, for whatever reason, that uh, either um, elect not to, or there may be some other health reasons and why they shouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to make sure, be mindful of that uh, as well. Um, but in the big scheme of things, um, whether mandated or not, uh, we want to encourage our airmen uh, to be vaccinated, not just for COVID, but everything else to make sure you know, they're, they're going to be healthy um, and be able to you know, not only conduct the mission, but once they take off the uniform, we still want them to be healthy. Absolutely. Okay. Um, during your speech and your remarks, you kept mentioning how important it is that the service is right-sized. Talk a little bit about, a little bit more about what that means. What will have to happen for it to be right-sized? And, and what are you looking for specifically? Is that more money from, from Congress? What specifically are you looking for for that to happen? When I, when I say right size, I'm not, it's not just the size, but it's the right mix of capabilities. And so I can have a very large Air Force with the wrong set of capabilities 
which not be prepared to fight against China. Or I can have a uh, large size air force that uh, doesn't have the mission capable rates um, that I need. And so uh, a good portion could be static displays versus actually uh, being there and providing uh, combat capability. And so part of this is the analysis we do to, to define what is the right mix of capabilities as we project where we think uh, our, our threat's gonna be in the future. I can, you know, we can look at today and keep what we have today, but that's not gonna match up against the threat we're gonna see in the future. And so you gotta change that, the, the mix in the numbers. And so I'd rather have a smaller capable force than a larger hollow force. And uh, that's the analysis we go through. Um, regardless of what happens with the budget, uh, I think our United States Air Force has some tough decisions to make um, as we go forward to make sure we have the capabilities uh, that will uh, be competitive against the threat and have called upon to uh, fly, fight, and win. Yeah. You made it quite clear in your remarks that China is a major concern. Um, Virginia Senator Mark Warner held a uh, hearing just not too long ago along with uh, Florida Senator Rubio about the concerns uh, with China just in hacking and things of that nature. Can you outline a little bit further what your concerns are specifically with China and how you intend to address those concerns uh, in leading our airmen? Well, the, uh, the concerns I have, and part of this is based on my, uh, my experience in the, the two years I had as the Pacific Air Forces Commander before I took the position I sit in today. And um, watching and talking to our internal analysts, talking to, to uh, our partners in the region, uh, watching how uh, the People's Republic of China had uh, changed its approach as far as from a military aspect, uh, but also as they were doing things to, as I mentioned in my remarks, bullying uh, countries within the, uh, within the region that doesn't always make the, the press here in the United States. Um, and uh, that, that to me is concerning because it, it, my concern is it might be slow and insidious, just like when you look at the features that were built in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. uh, those weren't built overnight. Uh, they were built right underneath our nose. And uh, my concern that uh, as China continues to increase their capabilities at a rate of change as far as numbers of, uh, of particularly air, you know, aircraft and missiles and the ranges of missiles, uh, that's gonna challenge us. Uh, we gotta be moving at the same pace, if not faster. Uh, we have an advantage, um, and one of our great advantages is our airmen, uh, well-trained, um, and, and be able to operate, and, and I try to keep them empowered as much as possible, you know, so they don't have to wait for me to make decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, they can make decisions down at the, at the lower levels. Uh, but but it's, it's how they're moving um, at a pace that, I, I would say sometimes doesn't always get noticed. Right. You know, and as I was kind of trying to highlight is, we don't wait till there's a crisis to then determine we should have done something. Right. Um, you also talked a little bit about, you know, well, everything is a concern in the Pacific at this point, I think. Um, and there's been some concerns about the air games that, or the war games that we um, participate in. Would there be any changes that you see in the way that we go forward in war games uh, in the Pacific? Well, it's not so much war, you know, the, the war games tell us things about, uh, you know, how we operate. And if we use some traditional models like we've, we've done in the past, where we're able to build up very, you know, over time, uh, with combat capability, I don't know that we'll be able to do that in the future. And so we gotta think differently about how we, uh, how we operate. Um, and just think about what's happened over the past, uh, really over 30 years uh, in the Middle East. You know, our army rotating into the Middle East to a location that's already built. All they gotta do is you know, bring some equipment and the airplanes come in, right. and then we, we operate from an existing base. That may not happen in the future. And so we gotta think differently. This is why for the Air Force, we're using agile combat employment to think about how would you operate from on a steer base? How would you operate if you weren't fully connected, um, but you had uh, enough commander's intent to be able to execute? How do we pre-position capability um, that is ready to go very quickly? And so it, it's, a, it's really a different approach about how we think versus traditional approach, which is why you know, um, in, in some of the war games we haven't done as well because we use a traditional approach mm -hmm. against an adversary who has uh, been watching us for the past uh, uh, 20 years while we've been focused on the Middle East. How does the construction of airfields in the, in the South China Sea impact that? How, how does that impact your Well, what it does, it provides them an opportunity to extend their reach further out. Um, and, um, you know, I've watched uh, in my time, particularly at PACAF, at Pacific Air Forces, um, them, the People's uh, Liberation Army uh, Air Forces deploy capability onto some of those uh, 
some of those islands and some of the airfields that, uh, that are there. And so uh, very easily they can move capability out there to put up uh, some defenses that would make it more, even more challenging. I think one of the one important things we all got to think about is how much of our the global economy flows to the South China Sea. Okay, right. and so that's going to impact not just you know U.S. and the PRC; it'll impact us globally. Why well, it's important that we got to pay attention to what's happening there in the in the South China Sea in particular. A question about uh, Afghanistan: um, Are you concerned about the ongoing airstrikes in Afghanistan and the possible civilian casualties? or other problems because there aren't as many U.S. troops on the ground there? And um, are, are the strikes less safe or less precise, perhaps? You know, I, you know one of the things that um, we, we always try to pay attention to is to minimize any type of collateral damage or civilian casualties when we execute. And we take great care in, in how, we, uh, uh, how we execute before we, uh, before we do, you know, that's what we're trained to do before we do any strikes. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm not necessarily concerned um, I'm concerned by making sure we're paying attention to it, but uh, I, I trust the professionalism of our airmen and, and how they operate. And they, uh, if they have any doubt, then uh, you know they question whether to employ ordinance because uh, we're responsible when we do this, and we, we uh, take great pride in making sure we get it right. In your remarks, you talked about um, our fighter jets and the production of those. Um, last month, the Government Accountability Office warned that projected sustainment costs for the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, uh, the largest acquisition project in the history of the Defense Department, are basically unaffordable. Um, do you agree with that assessment? And, and what do you think we need to do to get over that hump? Well, the, the F-35 is the cornerstone of our, um, of our fighter fleet. As a matter of fact, we have, uh, it's the second largest fighter fleet we have today. Uh, as it continues to grow, um, the largest right now is the F-16. Uh, the F-35 is right behind that. And it is the future of our Air Force. Right. And uh, part of this is us uh, working very closely with our industry partners on how we bring down that sustainment cost. Um, and it's on my radar. It's on our, our industry partner's radar. Um, and I'll tell you that I, uh, one of the ways to uh, do that is we work together. And uh, I've made a concerted effort to reach out and talk to the leadership from our industry partners to say, we've got to work this together. How does the, the, the recent grounding of many of those F-35s impact the mission? Well, it does impact a little bit of our readiness. But th again, this is where we start working very close with energy partners about how do we, how do we um, mitigate some of the things that uh, are um, from a readiness impact, whether it's a material readiness. Um, but here's what I will tell you, is that the, uh, the airplane flies very well. It doesn't break very often. Um, and uh, that, that's to me in talking to, uh, you know, have gone out to Hill Air Force Base, our largest F-35 base, talking to both our, our pilots and our maintainers, um, it does very well. Um, but we've been using them pretty hard here, in the, particularly in the Middle East here for, uh, for about 18 months. And that puts a little extra pressure and we're flying it probably a little harder than we, we expected to originally. Um, and uh, we we're putting uh, steps in to uh, work through how we bring the cost down and how we ensure uh, the sustainability going forward. I love to see the pride on your face when you say it flies very well. It does. It does. Yeah. I, you know, it's single seat, so I don't get a chance to fly it. I've, I've flown the sim. Right. Uh, but, um, you know, talking, uh, matter of fact, that one of the uh, uh, officers that just came to our headquarters was the, he just left wing command from Hill. And so he is probably the most qualified F 35 pilot inside of the Pentagon today. Okay. He got here this past week. Okay. And so being able to talk to him directly about what he's seen, what they've been able to do. And I met with him uh, back in February when I went to Hill. And, and really, because I want to spend time with him and his, his operators and maintainers to get their feedback. And that was exactly what they told me. It flies very well. And it doesn't break very often. Um, and, uh, and it's working very closely with our, our, you know, the, uh, our, our prime contractors associated with, uh, with the F-35 on how do, we, how do we work this together? Because this is all about our national security, and we're, we are in this together. And uh, we're, we, you know, we're all committed to the F-35. Um, I, I have to ask you, um, because when I see that look on your face, I think about the, the commercial. <laughs> I'm just an airman kicking your butt. I mean, that yeah. is just so awesome to me. Can you talk a, bit, a little bit about and share with the folks here how you ended up doing that, that commercial? Yeah, sure. and? Um, the story behind it, how it came together? Um, sure. So um, 
we were working on two recruiting commercials, and I was, um, we, that morning we sat in a conference room and were doing the voiceovers for the two commercials that they planned to shoot. And um, we had some extra time, so I was talking to the director, and actually I had done a uh, interview for Air Force Times with uh, Russ Davis, who's here in the audience, was on the cover of the Air Force Times about um, the lack of diversity within our fighter pilots. And I used in, in that article the fact that when I get in the airplane and I put my visor on and put my mask up, you don't know if I'm African American, or you don't know who I am. And then um, earlier this year, um, I spoke at a women's forum and I said kind of the same thing. And I was telling the story to the director and he goes, I think we want to take that. <laughs> and I said, well, you, can you, let's write down what I said so I make sure, because now it's, it's going live. So I said, <laughs> can, you, can you write it down so I can, you know, get it in my head right so I say it right. And, uh, um, and so that's what we did. So it was the first of the three commercials to come out and uh, came out, you know, right before the NBA finals at the right time. And uh, uh, I've got a lot of positive feedback about it. But uh, yeah. in some cases, me being me, I've always felt, you know, I'm not real cocky, but if I get an airplane, you better watch out. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> what I know. So uh, since you mentioned women in the service, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's no secret that we suffer from issues of diversity and inclusion uh, in our military ranks. Talk a little bit about um, what you have experienced personally and how you want to change what you've seen. Well, the, the thing I think about from a broad perspective, um, and this is the way I've always felt throughout my Air Force career, I always just wanted an opportunity. Okay, just give me an opportunity so I can compete. I want a fair shot. I think that's what all of our airmen want. And so one of my goals as the chief of staff is to create and maintain an environment where all can reach their full potential. So whatever you want to do, um, if you're qualified, you should have the opportunity to go do it. I, you know, personally, have had a couple examples. Uh, one of them I talked about in my video, um, and I'll never forget it. I was at the, I was in the BX exchange at Kunsan, and. Uh, Someone came up to me, and, you know, I was in my flight suit, and they go, are you a pilot? Well, probably because I was the first black pilot they'd ever seen, so it was kind of an anomaly. And there was only two of us in the entire wing, me and Mark Devane. I was in one squadron, he was in the other squadron. More recently, um, this is when I was at PACAF, and I was in civilian clothes, and I, uh, I parked in the PACAF commander's parking spot. <laughs> and somebody came out and chased me and said, hey, you, you can't, you know, that's the pac out commander's parking spot. I go, yeah, I know, I'm the pac out commander. <laughs> and to me, that was one of those uh, where people just assume. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, it bothers me. But what do we do to change it? Well, one of this is me sitting in the job I'm in today. Um, so I really believe young people only aspire to be what they can see. Um, if they don't see it, they don't think they can be it. And so hopefully I've opened the doors for a number of people just because I'm, you know, I'm in this job. Uh, like I said, I never aspired to be here. I was going to do four years and get out. It was my original plan. Uh, I've been having fun for, you know, past 32 years past my original game plan. Um, but it's really the, the thing we got to do is ensure that we provide, one, provide the opportunity, but also talk about those who actually have been put in positions where they can see Yes, you can do that, and don't sell yourself short. Yeah, it's really important. And I just want to point out that there's a lot of black history sitting on this stage right. today. Yeah, you as well. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, some questions from our audience. Uh, could you briefly comment on the overhaul of the United States Air Force pilot, excuse me, training program? Uh, sure. Um, you know, one of the things that um, when I think about it, and I even think about our son, my, I got two sons and my wife and I have two sons in their 20s, about how they learn and how they do things and very uh, digitally uh, adept at doing things. And so we're able to try to take advantage of some of those capabilities and understand how young people learn differently than when I went to pilot training. And so using virtual reality and some other aspects, um, and I was at, uh, at Randolph talking to some young lieutenants. We haven't even started flying yet, but that virtual reality goggles, and they were actually able to see all the, the ground references around the, around the airfield before they even got an airplane. Right. 
And so it's able to and really be more student focused versus the, uh, the way we would do it before. It's just, you know, everybody moves at the same pace, but not everybody learns at the same pace. And so when I was in poly training, if you were doing well, you sat down for a while for everybody else to catch up. If you're struggling, you flew every day to keep up. Now what we're doing is we bring folks in, they start together, but they not finish together. Uh, you gotta, you, get, you gotta you know, still meet the mark, but if you're going fast, we don't slow you down and let you get back out a bit faster. At the same time, we're looking at some other opportunities of, um, we, we, we tended to have an approach of, no matter if, how much background you had, you could come in, but you'd have to go through pod training as if you never flew an airplane before. And so we're looking at opportunities, if you already have um, some, some, a lot of civilian experience, we can accelerate your path, we just need to teach you how to fly in the military style versus civilian, some, thing, some things are a little bit different. Um, you know, marrying up with uh, civilian universities that have aviation programs, mm -hmm. uh, those kinds of, uh, uh, of things, and, it, and also having tracks depending on where you're headed. And then the last thing I'd highlight is um, helicopter training. Okay, we're going back to the future. We used to have helicopter training, just go, you just go straight to helicopters. Um, for the past probably 20 years, we've actually been sending helicopter pilots to fixed wing mm -hmm. training and then to helicopter training. Uh, we're going to focus on helicopter, and that'll free up some slots for fixed wing pilots. So uh, a number of different initiatives to one, speed up the training, but do things differently. So I'm going to ask you the question that some kid out in the audience is thinking right now. What about when I'm playing video games? Um, is that in any way um, a skill set that I can grow on? Or are you, are you actively engaged in what video games bring to the war fight? Well, I think so. As a matter of fact, I've asked that question of my staff that, um, you know, flying is hand-eye coordination. Right. And uh, playing a video game is hand-eye coordination. Or, you know, or thumb-eye right. coordination. Right, right, right. Um, <laughs> and so there are aspects of those that are really good at that. You could actually, you know, look at, you know, and so that's one of the things I've asked our team to take a look at is how do you incorporate that into some of the other um, the tools we use to determine someone's aptitude to go fly. Um, because the, how I got, you know, how I got, uh, the, what I had to take was a paper test. Mm -hmm. So a paper test doesn't tell you a lot about anybody's hand-eye coordination. And so using some of these tools will be helpful for us to, uh, and then um, we don't have um, as many washout of, of pilot training, you know, um, because you're able to use some of these, uh, these tools to, to assess them much earlier in the process. A question from the audience from Air Force Magazine. What were the biggest challenges or holdups to overcome with the force generation model? And if you can explain what the force generation model is sure. for our folks who don't know. So our, our force generation model is, is really um, how we determine uh, the forces we're gonna put in position to be ready to deploy when called up on to do so, at the same time maintaining the level of readiness. And what, we've, what we were doing uh, really for the past uh, 15, 16 years, uh, just committing our capability, as w w whatever was needed, we would send it. And what we were doing is we're running ourselves ragged. The United States Air Force is very popular, um, and because of that, uh, we get asked and get called up on the go, uh, we'd go. What that happens then is it impacts our, our, re our readiness and our future modernization. And so what we've done now is take um, and broken out into really four bins that are six months long apiece. So it's a commit phase where you're, you're either, when you're committed, you're either deployed or could be ready to deploy at a moment's notice. And then, you know, after you get done with that six months, you'll reset. And now you come back home, reconnect with your families, start some of your basic skill set training that you may not have done while you were deployed because you were doing something else. And then um, we'll do a prep phase, a, prep, a prepare uh, phase uh, bin. In that prepare phase, now you're starting to do uh, some higher level training. And then the ready phase, where we'll do some certification exercises, like sending uh, uh, to Red Flag, Red Flag Alaska, uh, supporting a United States weapon, uh, weapon school, or doing exercises with our, our joint teammates. And then you're back ready to commit. What we're trying to do with that is, is kind of a level of predictability for airmen, but also a level of predictability uh, for our force so that we can actually talk about the impact to readiness because you can always pull things forward, but when you pull things forward, all you're doing is building a hole someplace else. We haven't been able to articulate that very well. Gotcha. At the same time, we want to actually ensure that we have not only readiness today, readiness tomorrow, 
but also future modernization. And it's a way for us to kind of lay that out. Um, we expect that we're going to go IOC with it in, uh, in fiscal year 23. We're already taking steps today to start aligning our force, and uh, it's, it drives a bit more discipline, uh, not only for us as the United States Air Force, but as we work with the Joint Staff um, and, and the combatant commands about how we deploy force so we don't you know, burn everything up and then wish we had it ready to go if there was a, some type of crisis or contingency. Gotcha. Going back to the whole issue of diversity and um, change of the force, the way that the force looks, is the Air Force seeing an increase in the ranks uh, of, of women uh, service members? And if you had 15 seconds to speak to young female recruits, what would you say? Well, I do. Um, I do see that um, you know, the Air Force actually probably has uh, more women than any other service. And uh, I will give, one example I give you to you is uh, the, Air, the Air Force Academy class, class of 25 just came in, is the most diverse class in the history of the United States Air Force Academy. Okay. And so we, as an Air Force, have put concerted effort on, on, on diversity. And uh, for, for women, um, we've opened up just about every career field uh, for women as well. And so there are plenty of opportunities inside of the United States Air Force, uh, not just for, for women, but I think for, for any, anybody who wants to join. And that's the way, I, I mean, that's my goal is to, to you know, break down any type of barriers. And this is something that I think we've been able to do as we literally took a hard look at ourselves over the course of the past uh, year plus to um, look at, you know, our, our tools when we start assessing uh, different members in career fields, do we have things that, that are laid in there that were put in many years ago that uh, put certain members at a disadvantage than being competitive? So I just remembered that um, one of my uh, cousins, who is uh, an Air Force veteran, uh, she asked me to ask you a very specific question, so I want to make sure that I get this okay. in. And uh, what, do you do, what do you suggest a female uh, that is sexually harassed uh, do, knowing that their claim will either be ignored or they will face retribution for, uh, from others? And what options do women have uh, in the service when uh, they're put in that situation? Well, the first thing is I want to make sure that we don't put our, uh, any of our men in the situation they feel like uh, when they uh, put in a situation where any type of harassment, discrimination, that uh, our response will be like they're going to be ignored or not taken seriously. Because I take it very seriously. And part of this is that hold on to all of our, all of our airmen uh, responsible to treat each other with dignity and respect. Okay. You know, the, as you might imagine, quite a bit of dialogue here over the course of the past uh, several months on, you know, what we do. We do need to change. We need to do these things, uh, some things better. I, I don't disagree. Um, but this goes back to where I really believe we have to have an environment where all of our airmen can reach their full potential. It starts with leadership, leadership at my level, but leadership all the way down to the lowest level to create that that right environment. Here's what we tolerate and don't tolerate, and. Uh, for me, and then the other part is we got to make sure the system we put in place has trust across the board. You know, trust for the uh, uh, for every member, for the victim, trust in the process. Uh, and as we work through this, not only from a uh, not only the prevention, but also for the accountability piece and the victim support, and more importantly, the culture and climate we set across the force to move. You know these kinds of things out of our force. You know, ideally you want it not to be an issue, mm -hmm. but we gotta make sure that they feel comfortable that they can come report it and it's, it's taken seriously and we take the appropriate action. Another question from the audience. Uh, what are the challenges of convincing generations Y and Z to pursue a military career and how do their interests, their motivations and opinions of military service differ from previous generations? There's, there's a couple of things I want to highlight to you. Um, and this is based on, when I, whenever I travel, I always try to have either a breakfast or lunch with 10 to 12 airmen of, of all different backgrounds without any other leadership in the room so I can talk to them. Um, because as you might imagine, there's a bunch of people between me and them, and the information I get is filtered. Right. And so I want to really get from them, you know, about, and so I always ask them a question about leadership. 
and I ask them, you know, if you looked at your leadership, what, what, you, what do you want from them to make you successful? And the, the overwhelming response I get is we want our leaders to care. We want them to, we, we want them to know us as people. Okay, we get, yeah, we got a mission to do, but we gotta, we gotta know them as people. So it's taking the time to sit down and talk to them. That, that's the first thing. I think the other piece is um, that I really look at is, you know, one of my action orders is, is airmen, and it's about empowerment. A lot of these young people who come in and very talented, got a lot of great ideas, but what happens then is we don't allow them to let those ideas grow. We tend to squash them. Mm -hmm. We don't empower them. And so, um, you know, one of the things I want to try to do as much as possible is provide authority and intent to go do th the things that will make us a better Air Force. Uh, this, this hit me just recently. I was, at, uh, I was in Germany at Spang Dahlem and Ramstein. And I started thinking about it. During COVID, there was a whole bunch of guidance we were probably weren't doing. It begs the question, should we ever go back to it? Mm -hmm. Is it better than we were doing in 2019? And our airmen are going to be the ones that tell me that. As I say, there's a lot of good ideas in the Pentagon. They come out of the Pentagon, but they're not a good idea when they hit your base. <laughs> and so what I want to do is actually get their feedback. Right. And they just want to be heard and have opportunity to speak and, and then for us to be able to, to implement some of the things that they, they let out. We not, may, may not be able to do everything, uh, but I think just being able to listen to them and engage in, uh, in, in really the aspect of being, you know, the care. And I think particularly when you look at the things that occurred over the course of the past year and a half with COVID and um, the, the race issues we've had in the, in the, in the country and inside the force. Um, that's the part that I think has been helpful is we've had a lot of small group conversations where everybody, I would say, kind of takes the rank off and just has a conversation. Um, I think that's been very helpful. Okay. Well, before I ask the final question, let me just take a moment to acknowledge the organizers of today's event. Headliners co-team leaders Donna Limon Legere and Lori Russo. Today's headliner event coordinator Kevin Winsing. Club membership director Kate Helster, who's also been my producer today. And club executive director Bill McCarran. And of course, I could not do this without the team of the Press Club's Broadcasting Center. I'd also like to remind our viewers and our listeners today that this month marks nine years since the abduction of journalist Austin Tice. The National Press Club has started a petition on change.org to get the Biden administration to take action to have Austin returned home safely. So we hope folks who are listening today, who are watching today, will check out our petition and sign it. So I'm going to get off my soapbox now and ask the last question, or at least one of the last couple of questions, because we've still got about six minutes. Okay. Um, I asked you when we were in the, um, in the room there about, um, well, actually, I didn't ask you this. And this has to do with the Space Force, because I know when the Space Force was created, um, for me, I was making jokes. And I don't know if you remember that cartoon where it's like, Space Force. Anyway, um, yeah, that's right. I was making <laughs> jokes about that. Does having a sister service in the U.S. Space Force, you know, which kind of falls in the Department of the Air Force, does that cause budget troubles or, or competition for you? Are you concerned about how the two services are going to get together? No, not, not really. Because um, I don't see it as a competition. Okay. Uh, I see that we're working together. I mean, just think about uh, as the... Uh, the Air Force actually helped bring the Space Force along. And uh, we're still fairly well intertwined in a number of different areas. Okay. Um, there's capability from the Space Force that uh, help the United States Air Force do its job. In order for the Space Force to do its job, uh, the Air Force has a number of airmen, in particular, supporting a lot of their operations, their, their base operating support. Where well, the Space Force is designed to take care of the operational mission, the Air Force does a lot of the um, you know, base support for them to continue to do their mission. On top of that, uh, General Raymond, uh, Chief of Space Operations, we've known each other since we were majors. Uh, we first met in 1996. And uh, we've got a, we had a close working relationship over the years and uh, it still exists today. Um, and so it, it just takes constant dialogue uh, back and forth inside of the department uh, as we work through this. But we are, 
as services, um, we're pretty, pretty well intertwined um, in how we think about things. Uh, and um, because of that, um, it, it, it makes it pretty easy, to be honest with you, uh, to work together. What do you think about all of the um, recent space efforts by the likes of Elon Musk and, uh, and others? And I think last year, Elon Musk said the era of fighter planes, fighter planes and fighter jets is ending. What do you think about, about that comment that he, he made? Um, he's probably right in some aspects. I mean, and I think when you look at what they're able to do in commercial space, um, but not just space in general, but I think it look, you look across the nation and how uh, in different sectors, it helps us to go faster in certain areas. Right. And I know the Space Force has a good relationship with the uh, commercial space industry. And I think that's good. Um, because what we can learn from each other as we go forward, which will help us accelerate the rate of change that I talked about in my remarks. And that to me is important in how we work um, with different industry partners or non-traditional industry partners. You know, we, we're used to working with the, the major, uh, major uh, companies, mm -hmm. but there's, there's some small companies with some really good ideas and how do we better connect uh, with them, whether it's a small space company or some, uh, some other small tech company that has an idea that will benefit whether the Space Force, the United States Air Force, or our joint team. Okay. Well, I did tell you that I'd like to end my interviews with a fun question. So, um, you like movies? To an extent, yeah. To an extent, yeah. okay. I don't have a lot of time to watch movies. You don't? Yeah. Okay. Did you have time before COVID to watch movies? No, no. I, no I've watched a few movies. Though. Okay, yeah. so your favorite military movie, and if uh, they were to make a movie about the first black chief of staff, hmm. who would you want to, uh, <laughs> to be you? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. We'll see your favorite military favorite movie. Favorite movie first, yeah. Uh, probably two. The Longest Day. Okay. Um, I've always been a big, I finally made it to Normandy back in 2015, uh, but The Longest Day was one of the ones that I grew up on, I uh, really enjoyed, and then Top Gun. And the reason Top Gun is because Top Gun came out the year I graduated from pilot training. Okay. And uh, it was probably the most realistic flying movie that I'd seen. Wow. And it just left a mark on me. And I was you know, out of, out of pilot training by the time I, you know, I was already going to fighter. So I, you know, it was one of those where you kind of go, that, that's pretty realistic. So I'd also, I'm a Spider-Man fan too. So all the Spider-Man movies are on my <laughs> list as well. So uh, who would play me? Yeah, um, who would play you? I don't know. You know, I, actually, I just did an interview with, uh, or a, uh, a piece with Anthony Mackie. Okay. Who is the new Captain America. Right. I think I'd give him a shot. Nothing else. <laughs> so. Well, I don't seem to have um, our, our press club mug uh, up here, but uh, and that's perfectly fine. I'm going to give it to you okay. when we go upstairs. But I want to thank you so much well. for taking the time to join us here at the National Press Club and to inform us and, and make a little bit of news today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. <laughs>